Hi everybody, my name is John Downing. I'm a limnologist and aquatic ecologist and I put together a series of lectures and learning modules uh, on aquatic ecology and limnology. And um, this is um, aquatic ecology session 12 on bacteria and other microbes. And uh, up until now in this series we have been dealing mostly with physical aspects of aquatic systems and we're now going to move toward biology and chemistry and understand a little bit more about how the biotic components of these ecosystems function. So there are several things that you might already know about um, bacteria and other microbes in aquatic systems. Um, number one is that uh, microbes, um, bacteria and other microbes are necessary for all healthy life in aquatic systems. It's the same as is true for you that um, your body would be in very tough shape without microbes that digest your food for you. Um, and the same kind of thing is true for aquatic systems, as we'll see, that um, bacteria and viruses and other, other microbial organisms uh, form a, uh, you know, a substantial part of, and a very important part of the transfer of material and function, functioning of aquatic systems. And in fact, this is an embarrassingly small um, um, module on bacteria and microbes. We just don't have time to deal with them. We could do uh, 20 or so different um, talks on them. They're fascinating, important, and interesting, and the cutting edge of aquatic science. Now, the other part, uh, other thing you might already know about aquatic uh, microbes and bacteria is that certain kinds of microbes, uh, aquatic microbes, can trans uh, transmit waterborne diseases. And this has been known for quite a while. Um, the really famous example is John Snow, um, who was um, interested in trying to figure out, obviously, as many were, the huge, the effect of the huge, sorry, the um, cause of the huge cholera epidemic in London. And um, little was known, really, about microbes at that time. But he posited that, well, that the city of London had been not that he knew this, but the city of London had been dumping massive amounts of sewage into the Thames River for a century or so, and um, and in, uh, by 1854 they were also drawing their water out of the Thames River and um, uh, suffering hideous uh, degrees of mortality from from uh, cholera and probably other illnesses um, that they that were, were being transmitted from person to person. John Snow um, ha had a, a did it ran an experiment where he diverted he had the suspicion that um something in the water from the pumps that were the public pumps in london uh was a important in transmitting a disease so he closed down some of them and especially the broad street pump which seemed to have a great aggregation of disease around it and found in fact that um the diseases decreased substantially the cholera epidemic decreased substantially around that particular pump so um it's um this was sort of the beginning of um a knowledge about waterborne diseases and um and also um about the sort of the science of um epidemiology having to do with a uh, transmission of waterborne illness so the, you may understand that um uh, certain kinds of microbes transmit waterborne diseases, and in fact, um, that is so. So we'll start out with that, and then we'll talk about the more ecological aspects of it. Now, here's what I'd like you to, to learn out of this session here, is I'd like you to learn about waterborne pathogens first. We'll talk about them, because you may not think about them very much. And I'll tell you right up front that everybody in my aquatic laboratory um, has had at least one waterborne illness, even though I live in a fairly um, healthy area of the world. There are a lot of diseases that are transmitted by by water. Then I'd like you to learn how microbes are parts of aquatic biodiversity and we'll talk about things like bacteria and fungi and microprotozoa and viruses, little things um, that um, you may think are insignificant because they're small but in fact they are extremely important in aquatic ecosystems. I'd like you to understand the importance of microbial decomposition, that is to say decomposition by microbes because it actually is the foundation of what we call a microbial food chain. And I'd like you to learn about the microbial loop and that is um, uh, so, sort of um, the uh, heterotrophs and primary producers and sort of this uh, major microbial filter feeding food source and how this also can form energy sinks. So that 
those are objectives for this this session on microbes in aquatic systems well we all know that um, that uh, aquatic systems vary in a bunch of different ways and you've seen this big table before I'm sure but this just shows uh, as we move from oligotrophic to eutrophic ecosystems how many aspects of them begin to change and this is driven by phosphorus concentrations uh, nutrient concentrations that allow excess materials to grow in those systems but what I wanted to um, home in on here was the that the bacteria become uh, go from being very rare in oligotrophic and mesotrophic ecosystems to being very abundant in eutrophic systems I mean sorry abundant and then very abundant in hyper eutrophic systems in fact many of the factors that would kill uh, bacteria in nature things like ultraviolet radiation and um, um, oh and cold temperatures for some of the ones that live in the guts of people those disappear in uh, some of these eutrophic and hyper eutrophic systems and so we end up having um, uh, creating a system that's very much like the inside of the gut of a, of a human or another homeothermic organism there it, it is pretty dark down there because there's not much light penetration in eutrophic systems and lots of organic matter to decompose so bacteria can be abundant and quite persistent in uh, eutrophic and hyper eutrophic systems they vary um, with eutrophication and they vary in types that you see uh, with eutrophication there are a series of types of issues about microbes uh, first off there are pathogenic uh, and non-pathogenic organisms and the non-pathogenic ones are as I said before very abundant and necessary um, and they grow where dissolved organic carbon DOC is high where ultraviolet is low and temperature is high see this, this, they're often abundant in in dark dark areas with lots of organic matter and and they're very important for the functioning the healthy functioning of aquatic systems now the pathogenic ones are really a relatively small fraction of a lake's microbes except where the conditions are right and right or wrong which however you want to take it but um, where the conditions are right means where there's a lot of influx of pathogenic organisms and conditions that allow them to survive for a period of time and then be transmitted uh, to humans or other hosts they tend to be abundant where contamination occurs and they survive where ultraviolet radiation is low that is in the dark where dissolved organic carbon is high and the temperature is warm which is a perfect description of a hyper eutrophic ecosystem now um, microbes are, are really important to water quality and recreational use and this is just a graph from a study that I collaborated in um, some years ago where we asked people um, to assort hundred importance points among the seven ecosystem attributes seen in this in this graph and uh, um, and this is a res from over a thousand uh, surveys of over a thousand users of a single lake and interestingly number one by far was safety from bac bacterial contamination nobody wants to get sick when they're out for a recreational visit to a lake um, in, coming in second was water clarity being important and lack of water odor followed by finding a hard clean sandy bottom um, followed by a diversity of uh, fish species and habitat some people interested in um, catching fish and also diversity of wildlife seen a lot, a lot of other things were in the in the mix but these were the by far the most important ones um, basically the main thing is um, people like clean looking water and they like water that's go not going to make them ill. They can't always count on that. Um, these are important points assigned by the public in general for various kinds of activities. And, um, the, and, um, and they're by far things like picnicking, swimming, nature, uh, things, well, boating, variety of things that require um, water contact. And um, surprisingly, in this area, uh, where um, eutrophic ecosystems are really quite common where one can't always be certain that water is safe um, about a third of the people who um, am, enjoy recreation around lakes in this region never swim in them and another third of them rarely swim in them and um, very few about eight percent uh, frequently 
uh, frequently they swim in these waters. So people really understand. They're very cautious about the likelihood or the possibility of becoming ill in these sort of eutrophic ecosystems. Public concern is really very warranted. A million and a half children in developing nations die annually from waterborne diarrhea, a terrible illness that's very destructive and also kills many elderly people. Even in the United States of, uh, of America where uh, water is relatively uh, clean uh, worldwide, waterborne illness is common. Greater than half a million persons suffer moderate to severe waterborne infection each year and greater than seven million suffer mild to moderate infection each year. In the United States um, alone, 1,200 people die every year from waterborne illness, even in this fairly modern age when we pride ourselves on having very good water treatment. Many other places in the world, and, and perhaps where you live, it's even it's far, far worse than this. And I know that um, uh, developing good water systems, water supply systems, is very high on the list in, in, uh, for, uh, of importance in developing nations. A good, clean, healthy water supply does a great deal for the health of populations. Well, pathogens are just dispersed by water. They're, these are excreted in very large numbers in fecal matter. Um, and then, the, the, you know, the sort of the idea is that they rarely multiply in water, but remain viable for long periods. They're kept moist, oftentimes um, damp, and there may be some possibility of functioning a little bit, at least for sur surviving for a while. Drinking water uh, purification waste treatment is extremely important for keeping people safe against these uh, kinds of vectors of disease, um, but they're still important as vectors for disease. Oftentimes we monitor water for Escherichia coli, E. coli. You've probably heard of this. Um, it's um, a very famous uh, contaminant of meat and eggs and so on. And um, the reason that we're really concerned about it in specific, not that it's necessarily dangerous for you because your gut is, um, your intestines are just full of E. coli and you couldn't live without them. So some of them are very good for you. Um, so it's not because they themselves are necessarily pathogenic, although a few are. Uh, it, um, it is a very good indicator of the uh, existence or the, um, the contamination of water um, by other kinds, by well, by fecal material, which can carry all kinds of other kinds of diseases, um, including, um, well, uh, including things like um, salmonella, uh, the the vector that dry, that um, that causes cholera, various kinds of salmonella and various coliforms that are dangerous, and then some other things like uh, amoebae that uh, can uh, give rise to amoebic dysentery. One of the disadvantages of monitoring water for E. coli as an indicator of possible fecal contamination is that it dies pretty quickly compared to intestinal viruses, things like uh, poliovirus that can stay around for a very long time. Um, there are all kinds of other uh, pathogenic organisms out there that end up in water whenever E. coli is present. And so E. coli is used as an indicator, um, not as um, a, a real measure of um, of danger, but also, but a, a basically as a an indicator of possible fecal contamination or likely fecal contamination. Now, part of this is, of course, you have to remember that these things come from any kind of so-called warm-blooded animal or homeothermic organism, um, organisms that keep a fairly stable uh, body temperature. Not fish and stuff like that, but things like ducks and geese and humans and bears and deer and things have a lot of E. coli in them. Sometimes we get false po positives. I mean, well, if you don't mind eating the feces of other animals, it's probably not going to give you terrible diseases, um, except in some cases. Um, but uh, you may be cautioned away from those waters by high levels of Escherichia coli, which may be there um, due to other organisms other than people. But often uh, this is not the case. Um, uh, we um, we they are often of human um, well of human uh, derivation or um, uh, uh, indi good indicators of of human pathogenicity. Well, so fecal col coliforms, as I said before, are an indicator of trouble. They're a subset of bacteria populations from the feces of humans, livestock, wildlife, and waterfowl. Um, 
The sources of Escherichia coli to water bodies can be a variety of things, including, of course, um, a sewage uh, discharge. In fact, many places even now um, clandestinely uh, discharge uh, waste into recreational waters or, or public waters, and uh, uh, so it, it, the sewage can be, in fact, uh, there. But also feedlots that leak uh, these things, faulty septic systems. Septic systems are those kinds of systems that people use if they have a well and don't are not on a sewer, um, a public sewer system. Um, barnyards are important sources. Pasture lands, range lands, manure storage facilities, and waste lagoons. Faulty wastewater treatment plants, wild wildlife, waterfowl, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there are lots of sources. Um, but generally, they're a pretty good indicator of um, of uh, con contamination by human waste and therefore are used as an indicator of it. There are federal standards that have been established for fecal coliform uh, counts that are permissible. And uh, fecal coliforms uh, are supposed to be, um, if, well, if they're greater than 200 colony-forming units, that is bacteria that you can get to grow when you feed it. Um, yeah, per, well, and these are 200 colony forming units per 100 milliliters of water. That is a standard. One should be below that number, and uh, if one goes above it on a consistent basis, then um, that's a very strong indicator of trouble. Um, shelf, shellfish producing waters, um, shellfish are, are filter feeders, and that would be things like oysters and clams. Um, the, the standards are even more stringent because um, when you eat a raw oyster or a raw clam, you're also eating what it ate. And so you may be picking up some of those uh, microbes absolutely directly. <clears throat> so illness is associated with E. coli and fresh waters. Immersion in bacteria contaminated water can result in all kinds of different in infections. And, and as I mentioned, everyone really in my laboratory has had something like this. Um, and th these can be infections of eyes, ears, nose, and throat, and so on. Oftentimes people fall ill after swimming and they blame it on something else. So sometimes they'll blame it on, oh, if it's a skin issue, they'll blame it on swimmer's itch or something, or maybe, you know, that bad food that you ate because it sat out in the sun too long and so on. But oftentimes um, there are um, big effects of the water if there are pathogens, um, uh, pathogens present. Epidemiological studies are uh, um, that have... Um, have associated the occurrence of gastrointestinal illness with coliform concentrations, and these have been used to develop criteria, and that's where those criteria numbers come from. From bacteriological data, fecal coliform concentrations of this 200 per milliliter, 100 milliliters, causes about eight illnesses per thousand swimmers at freshwater beaches. And generally, it's interesting that um, you know things like eight um, eight illnesses per thousand swimmers is sort of deemed to be acceptable in some way. Um, marine beaches are a little bit better at preserving some of the pathogens, and so the same kinds of counts are, are associated with 19 illnesses per thousand swimmers uh, in, uh, salt, in saline waters. Um, so they're a little bit different in fresh waters and in saline. But generally, there's not a lot of work done on this, and probably um, uh, whatever your region you're in, if you're dealing with fresh waters, they're not specific um, epidemiological studies that have been performed on them, probably. Okay, so um, these are some of the CDC uh, noted outbreaks. You know, this, these are the data are 20 years old now, but they continue to collect these sorts of numbers. Um, most cases of any kind of uh, recreational contact uh, pathogenicity um, are go unreported, um, so we don't hear about them very much. But uh, C CDC, as far back as 85 to 1994, um, um, uh, reported very large numbers of outbreaks and cases. And you'll notice outbreaks means sort of a cluster of, of disease, and number of cases would be then um, the number of people that were involved in it. And uh, the uh, diseases are no fun. Shig shigella, shigellosis, acute gastroenteritis, adenovirus, conjunctivitis, that would be causing eye infections, often can uh, break out. Uh, cryptosporidium also, E. coli 157H7. This one is the so-called jack-in-the-box um, E. coli, so that this one has been actually, um, has been very 
uh, dangerous in very uh, in various outbreaks, but not so much in not only a couple of them at that time f uh, from um, fr uh, fresh waters. Um, swimmers itch some uh, some outbreaks, and these are cause various dermatitis, uh, giardiasis, uh, which is uh, beaver fever, which is a terrible illness. This is actually much more common now than it was. Uh, Norwalk-like gastroenteritis, um, nor and this is uh, like this cruise ship um, uh, gastroenteritis, a very unpleasant um, uh, experience. Leptospirosis, amoebic menin meningioencephalitis, um, several cases, and as you see, the outbreaks are single cases. Viral meningitis also, and many, many more. And these are, happen pretty frequently, and um, but mostly they go undiagnosed, unre unreported, and undiagnosed. Uh, last time I had um, a waterborne illness, um, uh, it took uh, two nights in emergency to get it finally almost figured out, but not quite. And then it took a um, a physician who'd spent time with the Navy in Japan um, to really figure out that what I had was a, a viral blood infection that's waterborne. So um, uh, most physicians are not well equipped to, d to figure these things out and usually they'll call them something like idiopathic, which means, I don't know, I think. Um, now, we should think a little bit about epidemiology because this is how there's a, how one um, uh, establishes a relationship between uh, outbreaks of disease and various vectors. And these um, epidemiological criteria are, um, there are seven, uh, well, nine of them actually. Um, and these are uh, based on the strength of association, that is, is there a statistical significance of risk of expose, uh, exposed people versus non-exposed people? Is the, uh, is the association consistent? Is it observed in several studies? Do you see it over and over again? Is there a specificity of association? And this is quite difficult because the specific type, specific types of exposure lead um, to specific types of illness, oftentimes with waterborne disease. Temporality, and this is an important one. So the cause usually has to precede the effect. So you can't have get a disease and then think it's caused by something afterward. And also being able to establish some biological gradient. Uh, looking at the amount and duration of exposure that's uh, and finding it related to illness. And then plausibilities. One needs to look into the biological aspects of it and make sure it really works, that it, it can work biologically. Find whether there's a link between disease and environmental factor agrees with biological and toxicological knowledge. And also coherence, uh, the lack of disagreement among sources. Um, there, These are very important uh, important criteria. And um, and important to apply in determining what the causes of waterborne illness can be. There, uh, the cases of waterborne illness are in fact climbing, and you can't really very well see the time scale on this. But what I do want you to see is that it's increasing and increasing with some speed. Um, these are waterborne illness cases um, um, reported from United States drinking water. Um, and they're uh, climbing. In, in fact, in, uh, even in the last a few years, you probably can remember newspaper reports of water systems being shut down, people being hospitalized, and so on, um, because of water. And you may have noticed that when there's a flood, for example, um, water supply is quickly shut off. The reason for this is the floods usually pick up fecal matter from uh, sewage lagoons in fairly untreated form and then deliver them into the drinking water supply. There are lots of examples of epidemiological studies of recreational contact, but here's, um, here's, here are a couple of them. And these are, uh, here is an old one from France, uh, from uh, the Riviere Ardèche. Um, and this contrasted people with, who had contact with water and those who didn't, uh, about 6,000 tourists. And the ones who had contact had two and a half times more gastroenteritis. Um, a gastrointestinal disease, two and a, two and a half times acute GI, um, four times the skin disease almost, and um, this was 20 streptococcus, not E. coli, per 100 mil st uh, standard of um, and, and, and of of water. Uh, also, here's a you know you can imagine the water around Hong Kong. It's a very dense population. This is from some time ago, but um, again. 
contact versus non-contact con contrasting. And in the those with contact, they found five times as much gastrointestinal um, illness, um, incredible amount of increased ear infection, increased eye infection, um, skin, respiratory fever. Um, and the best correlations were f between disease uh, and, um, and illness were uh, with Escherichia coli, not a fecal strep. We measure a lot of different bacteria when we look at these things <coughs> to get the to figure out how to calculate then sort of a rating for what is dangerous. Excuse me. There are lots of uh, waterborne pathogens, and these are things that would be possible when E. coli are found, and they include. Um, uh, a variety of things, uh, including Cryptosporidium. It's, this is a spherical po um, protozoan parasite. It's very small, four to six microns in diameter, and this is a tiny thing. Um, Giardia um, is also a flagellated protozoan. Here's Giardia down here. Um, and um, Legionella is a bacterial um, a pathogen, and this causes Legionnaire's disease that you may have heard. Uh, about it causes a thing that uh, resembles pneumonia and various salmonella. Here's a cryptosporidium over here. Lots of these things are fairly dangerous and transmitted in water. Some other really fun stuff you can get from bad water cholera and other vibrios, uh, typhoid and paratyphoid fevers, shigellosis, um, campylobacteriosis. This is a very common bacterial pathogen and uh, uh, and um, Oh, pets and humans can get it. It causes very severe gastrointestinal disease. Um, various E. coli, of course, I already talked about the 157H7 strain, Escherichia coli, causes a GI um, um, infection that results in death of people who are immunocompromised. Yersinia, these are the plague bacteria that you have heard about in history, and they uh, lead to... Um, gut perforation, lymph infections, stiffened joints, plesiomonas infections, and this is a bacterium. It causes arthritic uh, kind uh, arthritic symptoms and osteomyelitis, septic arthritis, meningitis, aeromonas is a um, attacks the bacterial soft tissue. Uh, here's some more pseudomonas, a big list. I don't want you to be afraid, but be aware that a lot of different kinds of um, diseases are actually um, caused by blood uh, by waterborne pathogens, <coughs> and so clean water is very important for the health of people. And here's some more: schistosomiasis, giardiasis, cryptosporidiosis, cyclospora, um, nigleria, and viral hepatitis. Really, lots of them. Now, bacteria can in indicate trouble, and and here are a couple of things that are really worth remembering. I think I. Well, I hope a lot of this is. But one of them is, when it rains, you often see a lot more uh, bacteria in the water. And they aren't necessarily uh, a sewage source, but can wash in off the land. Uh, we often do mapping of um, pathogenic or potentially pathogenic bacteria to try to locate sources. And it's a very effective way to do this. And here you see a map of concentrations of Escherichia coli in a lake in the state of Iowa. Um, Bacteria are most ab abundant after rainfall events, and people say that they are um, almost never found in open water, which is not true. You can see that very easily from this map. Um, there, but bacteria are most abundant near the sources, as they do tend to disperse and and uh, die to some degree. Bacteria die rapidly when light is abundant. Uh, and when there's little organic matter and temperatures are unfavorable. So you have to remember that enteric systems are around 37 degrees Celsius. So those really warm waters are probably good at hanging on to some viable um, pathogen, pathogenetic um, uh, um, bacteria and other microbes. Risk of illness is calculated like this, and this is bacterial counts per 100 milliliters on the x-axis. And here we have the relative risk, and you can see the relative risk going up and this risk um, is uh, uh, is risk of uh, calculating the of contracting the disease uh, relative to uh, non um, contact, and this is so it's you know very substantial increases in risk. 
Here's some other relationships. This on the left-hand side, uh, the, this axis is the odds of illness. That is uh, to say, the likelihood of uh, getting a, of swimming associated cases rates per thousand. Um, so uh, this um, so this would be um, uh, something like one uh, percent or something of the population, and so on. But you can see that he, over here is bacterial counts for various kinds of bacteria and various studies and diseases, they tend to increase with these indicator bacteria. Bacteria, though, as I mentioned before, is essential to ecosystem function and shouldn't be ignored. It's really important for the decomposition and recycling of detritus. So anytime you hear of decomposition, you have to think of bacteria. Um, there are also our bacterial primary producers, and these are things like purple sulfur bacteria, but also the cyanobacteria, the blue-green algae, are primary producers. But there were, um, but the um, purple sulfurs and some of the purely bacterial, non-cyanobacterial uh, primary producers are rarely very important in ecosystems. They're also super important for performing nitrogen con conversions, and that is to um, to nitrify um, uh, nitrify uh, nitrogen sources and also to engage in denitrification, which is the extraction of nitrogen and uh, sending it up into the atmosphere that we'll learn about um, a couple sessions from now. Um, and also uh, these microbes are very important as a food source for filter feeders. And this is what we refer to as the microbial loop. Now. Here's the what goes on with dissolved organic carbon. Dissolved organic carbon is almost ex uh, exclusively taken up by bacteria and decomposed by them, although we're finding that a fair bit of this dissolved organic car carbon is actually um, photo-oxidized. So um, it can just, uh, what that means is light can um, break it down pretty fast. But um, if you look at a kind of a regular food chain, here we have algae over here and algae are eaten by zooplankton over here and the algae form particulate detrital carbon here some of this goes into dissolved organic carbon but m much of it um, is uh, shunted over to bacterial carbon and turned into bacteria and much of the dissolved organic carbon is likewise so these can be important parts of the overall carbon pool and bacteria play an important role in decomposition of both particulate detrital carbon and dissolved organic carbon. Detritus is a word you should know if you don't already. Detritus is, is sort of like the stuff that builds up in your garage or something, the extra stuff that's not very useful that um, is basically left over after, after life and gets broken down uh, over time and, and decays. Now I want to contrast um, the conventional old-fashioned view of how lakes work with the microbial loop carbon flow and I'll do that simply by uh, using this mask over here. <coughs> so um, here is what, how people used to think of aquatic ecosystems. So the carbon dioxide comes in, it gets turned into phytoplankton by photosynthesis. This phytoplankton is eaten by lovely tasty food sources for fish, um, things like clodocerans. They are eaten by copepods. It's also eaten by rotifers. It goes into copepods also, and then everything eventually gets eaten by fish. So this is kind of the old-fashioned view of it, of how this all works, and then all eventually ends up uh, decomposing and turning into dissolved organic carbon. However, if you take, uh, you look at the full view of how this really happens, there's a lot of leakage of dissolved organic carbon out of the, all those compartments. Every time there's a transaction done here, there's a leakage, just as you find um, the various um, carbon sources in sewage um, that are uh, partially broken down material. That dissolved organic carbon, due to digestion and breakdown and so on, is free in the, uh, in the water column. And it goes over to what's called the heterotrophic microbial loop. And it, that means that the DO, dissolved organic carbon, DOC, is taken up by bacteria directly. And bacteria are, are taken up by two groups, the flagellates and the ciliates. These are like little tiny animals that can eat bacterial-sized particles. And then really lots of this, the bacteria are eaten directly by cladocera, water fleas, important fish foods. Um, um, flagellates are, are eaten uh, by uh, cladocerans, and um, ciliates are also eaten by cladocerans and copepods and fish directly for some of them. 
So this is an entire shunt of loop that we didn't know much about, but a very important one for the um, health and well-being of aquatic ecosystems. Here's the way CALF looks at this. This is a redrawn um, picture he, um, uh, uh, from the new um, uh, edition of the CALF Limnology book. Um, he, uh, this, he draws a line across here saying this up here is a classic grazer food chain in the plankton. This is what we used to believe. Same picture I showed you in the previous. And, um, and what we have here is various kinds of phytoplankton eaten by crustacean rotifers. And uh, crustacean rotifers then are, are, um, are the carnivorous ones then take up these filter feeders, herbivorous ones, and then these are eaten by birds and fish. And then there's this benthic food chain over here, stuff living on the bottom that does likewise with uh, detrital material. But the big change is uh, was that if we look down in the microbial food web, we see that uh, basically there's a lot of autochthonous and allochthonous dissolved organic matter. Autochthonous and allochthonous are two words worth learning too if you haven't already. Autochthonous means it's been um, created within the ecosystem. Allochthonous means it comes from outside. So this stuff then is taken up by a variety of different kinds of uh, organisms and um, and used by bacteria, mixotrophic flagellates, ciliates, heterotrophic dinoflagellates, amoebae, uh, heliozoa, um, and um, they also eat bacteria directly uh, and break down all this material um, and turning it into this detrital pool that's processed and reprocessed. So microbial loop um, microbial food web, a very important aspect, um, and another reason that we owe a great deal to microbes. Now, it used to be thought that the bacterial abundance, uh, bacterial abundance was thought to be insignificant, but here I'd like to just show you uh, a couple of different grabs, graphs. Well, they're actually the the same um, uh, same graph. This is over here. The this is easier to see because this is in logarithms, but you can see it in linear format here. Here we have phytoplankton carbon. So these are the algae that we normally think of as primary producers. And there's really a lot of uh, back, uh, uh, the ratio of bacterial carbon to phytoplankton carbon is really very high in oligotrophic systems where there's not much algae growth. You can see that best over here. But here's the bacterial carbon per phytoplankton carbon. This is the ratio. Here means there's as much uh, bacteria as there is phytoplankton. This is twice as much bacteria, three times, four times, five times. Of course, in a eutrophic lake, say out in this region, um, you don't the you don't see quite as uh, quite as much. And here on this graph, you'll see both limnetic and marine ecosystems. And so, um, in limnetic systems, have um, a little bit more bacteria than do marine systems uh, in general. So, um, so bacteria can be uh, especially in eutrophic systems, more abundant in terms of carbon in their bodies than even the phytoplankton that we used to think were the traditional source of food. There are increases uh, in bacteria in eutrophic systems. Here's the uh, phosphorus concentration and here's the bacteria numbers per uh, milliliter. This 10 to the 6th is kind of important that even in fairly clean, clear waters, we have about a million bacteria per milliliter of water quite a lot of bacteria if you think about it. Um, um, you know, and, and that means like something like um, uh, 50,000 per drop uh, of uh, bacteria, so I mean, per drop of water. Amazing and getting much higher, 10 to the seventh, and we've seen even higher rates than this in some eutrophic systems. Eutrophication tends to lead to, ha to us, us to have a lot of bacteria, not just um, pathogens, pathogenic ones, but also um, those that are, are good in processing detrital material. Bacteria and vi viruses tend to respond similarly, and here's a, a graph showing the relationship between virus-like particles on the y-axis and bacterial abundance on the x-axis. And I think you can see that um, bacterial abundance, uh, the, the virus-like particles increase with bacteria. Not too shocking. In fact, right here is one uh, per mill, uh, one million per milliliter, and we read across, and there may be uh, an order of magnitude more virus-like particles in um, in inland waters or in freshwater systems than there are in marine uh, per unit 
uh, per unit bacteria. A summary then of session 12. Microbes include all kinds of things, um, and they include bacteria, viruses, protozoa, etc., flagellates and ciliates and things. Aquatic microbes are disproportionately important to their size. They're tiny things, but they do a terrific amount of work. Um, and we can think of um, bacteria and other microbes in two groups, the pathogens and non-pathogens, those that cause disease and those that don't cause disease. Those that don't cause disease are essential and important to cycling of material. Those that do cause disease often are there because of human carelessness as well as um, pollution and, um, and eutrophication. Waterborne illness worldwide continues to be a significant concern and, and one of the most um, most important reasons to manage water well. Coliforms are used, uh, things like Escherichia coli, fecal coliforms are used to indicate whether there might be some danger, but they're only an indicator of pathogen presence and not a smoking gun per se. The cost of screening for all types of pathogens uh, uh, would be uh, in, uh, prohibitive, although we are in fact um, using gene chip technology and so on, we should be able to do that in, in a few years from now if we can already now. Pathogens cause a large range of illness and I gave you a huge list of them and they're worth thinking about and avoiding. And bacteria are everywhere but uh, more abundant after rainfall and, um, and uh, because they will flow in, they're everywhere in lakes of course out in the open water and they're, but they tend to be most abundant near to the sources. In, and microbes, in sort of in great summary, uh, microbes and other, uh, sorry, bacteria and other microbes are very important organisms and nothing to be avoided, particularly except for the pathogens, uh, and, and they're essential to healthy ecosystem function.